You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Time Magazine says although Fortas had not broken any law, he had been clearly guilty of a gross indiscretion. The charges became the major topic of conversation in Washington, from the quarters of the Capitol to Georgetown cocktail parties. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the Great Pyramid? Have you marveled at the golden face of Tutankhamun? Or admired the delicate features of Queen Nefertiti? If you have, you'll probably like the History of Egypt podcast. Every week, we explore tales of this ancient culture. The History of Egypt is available wherever you get your podcasting fix. Come, let me introduce you to the world of ancient Egypt. It was not long before 1942, strange as it may seem, that poor people, indigents, paupers, were regarded in some of the states as in the same category as uh, diseased and rotten food. They were excluded from entry into states. Five dollars and change. A few bottles of beer a Coca-Cola. These items were stolen from a pool hall in Florida and would change the interpretation of a part of the Constitution. A local man, Henry Cook, 22-year-old, lived nearby, told the police that he had seen this guy, Gideon, walk out of the bar. He said he had a bottle of wine in his hand and his pockets were filled with coins. And then he got into a cab. Gideon is later found at another bar. He had a criminal record, though his crimes were of an earlier vintage. He was put on trial for robbery, and you'd expect there would be a lawyer, but Gideon couldn't afford it. Not going to pay a lawyer with rolls of coins the way he paid that taxi cab that night. So you represent yourself. Florida law at that time only gave indigent defendants no-cost legal counsel in death penalty cases. Clarence Earl Gideon was tried, and he was no match for the prosecution. On August 4th, 1961, Gideon was convicted of breaking in with intent to commit petty larceny. And on August 25th, the local judge gave Gideon the maximum sentence, five years in state prison. While incarcerated, Gideon studied the American legal system. He concluded that the judge had violated his constitutional rights under the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution because it was applicable to Florida through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. That's what Gideon is researching and believes and is about to make an argument. He then wrote to the FBI office in Florida, said they couldn't help him, and then the Florida Supreme Court, and he was denied assistance. In January 1962, he mailed a five-page petition for writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States. It was handwritten, asking the nine justices to consider the case. The Supreme Court agreed to hear his appeal. And because Louis Wainwright was the director of the Florida Department of Corrections, the case was called Gideon v. Wainwright. Now, the Supreme Court wasn't going to allow Gideon to represent himself again in this august chamber. They provided a lawyer to him, and that lawyer was Abe Fortas. He's well known. Fortas, President, we'll be right on the line, sir. Thank you. Not only a lawyer who had argued before the Supreme Court before, he had served in the federal government, and he's a good friend to the vice president then of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. In this case, Florida Assistant Attorney General Bruce Jacob was assigned to argue against Gideon. Fortas argued that a common man with no training in law could not go up against a trained lawyer. You're essentially not giving him a fair trial. There were the decisions of the Supreme Court on other aspects of the right to counsel. There were precedents. As early as 1932, 
the Supreme Court had ruled in a revolutionary decision that the Constitution of the United States, the Due Process Clause of the, Fifth Am of the Fourteenth Amendment, required the states to furnish counsel to indigent defendants in capital cases where the defendant might be executed. That was the famous Scottsboro case. The decision was handed down not by the liberal or radical Supreme Court uh, that some people think there is today, but by the nine old men. You cannot have a fair trial without counsel is the standard he asked the justices to hold the courts to. Bruce Jacob argued, on behalf of Florida, that the issue at hand was not that but a state issue. It's not a federal issue. The practice of only appointing counsel under special circumstances in non-capital cases sufficed. Otherwise, Florida's going to have to overturn thousands of convictions would have to be thrown out. Florida had for 21 years followed in good faith what the Supreme Court had previously instructed in 1942. Betts v. Brady. So when we talk about Gideon versus Wainwright, and you know that you have the right to defense counsel, right? That's still relatively new uh, because the Supreme Court actually rules the opposite. So let's look at that, Betts v. Brady. In Betts, the petitioner is a farmhand. He's out of job and he's on relief and he's indicted on a charge of robbery like Gideon. He was too poor to hire a lawyer. He informed the court and requested that counsel be appointed to defend him. His request was denied. So he's put the trial without a lawyer, and he conducted his own defense. Betts is found guilty and sentenced to eight years imprisonment. The court, all the way up to the Supreme Court, says that's okay, because he was smart. Well, at least he had an ordinary amount of intelligence. SCOTUS upheld the lower court's decision in that case. Here's what they said in that case. Very different from the way things are now. As we have said, the 14th Amendment prohibits the conviction and incarceration of one whose trial is offensive to the common and fundamental ideas of fairness and right. And while want of counsel in a particular case may result in a conviction lacking in such fundamental fairness, we cannot say that the amendment embodies an inexorable command that no trial or any offense or in any court can be fairly conducted and just it afforded a defendant who is not represented by counsel. Totally foreign to how we see the Sixth Amendment now, right? Abe Fortas argued something else. Betts was wrong, he said. No lay person can be a lawyer. Even looking at that case, um, Betts was a horrible lawyer for himself, just as Gideon was. Without a lawyer knowing the laws and the rules, a man doesn't have a chance. The Supreme Court agrees now, and in Gideon v. Wainwright, they say, the right to be heard would be in many cases of little avail if it did not comprehend the right to be heard by counsel. Now, before I move on to what we're really going to talk about, which is the lawyer that represented Gideon, Abe Fortas, and would actually get on the Supreme Court himself, I just want to stop here and talk a bit about this. Because it's worth noting that things that we think are just hard and fast rules have been morphed and changed over time in legal interpretation. And sometimes we might consider it good. Like I think most people in this case consider this change that the court made in uh, the Sixth Amendment to be a good change in interpretation. And sometimes it might be considered bad depending on your politics. But there is some fungibility to how the Constitution has been interpreted by SCOTUS over time. This is the space of 20 years from uh, justices saying you don't get a counsel to justices saying, of course you get a counsel. So powerful is the idea that you get a defense counsel through the Sixth Amendment is that that attorney who represented Florida, Bruce Jacob, you know, he, he was doing his job. But later, he would dedicate a lot of his time to the cause of making sure state legislatures provided defense lawyers for criminal defendants. And he's written articles um, fairly recently about the state of legislatures underfunding that. No zealot like a convert, I guess. So what happens after the decision? Abe Fortas and Gideon prevail, and Abe Fortas tells Gideon, I know a good lawyer in Miami, and I can provide him for you. 
Gideon said he didn't want a Miami lawyer. He wanted a local Panama City lawyer, town that he was convicted in. And he wanted specifically local lawyer Fred Turner. Turner agrees, and the judge schedules a retrial. During that trial, this local lawyer is able to quickly establish that this local witness, Harold Cook, had lied in the first trial. He had said, for instance, that he never had a criminal conviction. It doesn't necessarily mean that Gideon didn't do the crime. It's likely he didn't. It's possible this uh, Cook did it. That's what everyone local thought. Or that Cook may have been the lookout for a group of men who stole everything. So what really happens in the retrial is they establish that the major witness is incredible. Something that a lawyer can do for you. That Gideon isn't going to be able to do on his own. The conviction is thrown out. Gideon resumes his way of life. He's never someone who has a lot of money. He dies in 1972 at age 61 and is buried in an unmarked grave in Hannibal, Missouri, where he originally was from. The American Civil Liberties Union raised money and added a granite headstone for him. But this is a side note to what I'll talk about today. I want to talk about the lawyer responsible, Abe Fortas, who would be appointed by President Johnson to the Supreme Court not long after to replace Kennedy's sole appointment on the court, Goldberg. He was no stranger to Johnson. This was no name ticked off the list. Fortas was a close advisor. He had known Johnson since he was a young congressman. It dates back to the 30s. Johnson's a congressman. Fortas is the director of the Interior Department's Division of Power and in a position to help Johnson with the Texas Dam Project. They came from different backgrounds. Fortas was brought up in Memphis, attended Yale Law School, but both of them were kind of rising in Washington, D.C. at the same time, and they both admired Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal. When Fortas is brought up to become a justice of the Supreme Court, there's only three dissenting votes. Now, what happens when you have a close friend of the president in the Supreme Court? Now, Fortas insists that Johnson never asked him about any Supreme Court decisions, and he would never talk about it. Johnson wouldn't ask, he wouldn't tell. Just didn't come up. But he did feel the need, still as a justice wearing a robe, to go to the White House in certain meetings, particularly as his friend Johnson becomes embroiled in the Vietnam situation and needs advice. So he's doing this while he's on a Supreme Court. That is raising eyebrows. He also authored a few decisions. His most influential decision while Fortas is on the court, and it's not a long time, is Tinker v. Des Moines. Technically, Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District in 1969. At a public school in Des Moines, Iowa, students have a plan. They're going to wear black armbands at school. They're going to protest silently against the Vietnam War. Uh, The Tinker family is a family of protesters and religious objectors to war. When the principal becomes aware of the plan, he warns the students they would be suspended if they wore these armbands because the protest might cause a disruption in the learning environment. That led most of the students not to wear them, but a few, including the Tinker and some other families, the Tinker name was used on the case, they wear them, they're suspended. Paul Tinker, eight years old, was in the second grade. Hope Tinker, 11 years old, in the fifth grade. And third and fourth member. John Tinker is 15 years old in the 11th grade. Another man, uh, Christopher Eckhart, 11th grade pupil, is in the case, but his name doesn't survive on the Supreme Court case. In in all cases, these seven students who resisted the order out of 18,000 students in the school system have parents who were committed Quakers or committed for peace. Parents sue the school system, violating their children's right to free speech. And the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Iowa sides with the school. Armbands could disrupt learning. The students appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals, lost, and then take the case to the Supreme Court. And in a 7-2 decision written by Abe Fortas, The Supreme Court's majority rules with the famous writing, students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. The court took the position that school officials could not prohibit only on the suspicion that the speech might disrupt the learning environment. 
You have to understand the circumstances, though, of Fortas's decision. This is an armband. This is a silent protest. This isn't an invitation to just do anything at school. And there were two dissenting votes on the Supreme Court who ruled that the armbands themselves are a distraction. The school officials had a legitimate right to ban them. Tinker sets a really high standard for justifying punishment of students for merely expressing something. Fortis also authored a key decision, 1968 case of Epperson v. Arkansas, where a statute banning the teaching of evolution was thrown out by the Supreme Court. But he wasn't a free speech absolutist. In Street vs. New York, Fortis joined Chief Justice Earl Warren and others in dissenting on a case involving the burning of the U.S. flag. Fortis comes from a philosophy that is different from the current majority on the court. Here's what he says. The ignorant way of looking at constitutional law is to totally disregard what the founding fathers did when they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. When they wrote the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they wrote the documents to survive the ages. What they did was set out what Justice Learn Hand said was the majestic generalities it was their plan, their hope, their intention that these majestic generalities would survive a nation. So philosophical, moral, social, political guides to decisions, just like the Ten Commandments or the Bible. You change that to here's Justice Kavanaugh in his, in his hearing before Congress, before becoming a justice. It is sometimes said that the Constitution is a document of majestic generalities. I view it differently, as I see it, the Constitution is primarily a document of majestic specificity. And those specific words have meaning. Absent constitutional amendment, those words continue to bind us as judges, legislators, and executive officials. Earl Warren announces, he tells, you know, Lyndon Johnson, I, I'm not going to be able to continue due to his age and his condition and Lyndon Johnson nominates his friend, Abe Fortas, for the opening. Here's Time Magazine. In view of President Johnson's fondness for unexpected appointments, the nomination of Fortas to succeed Earl Warren was surprising only in its predictability. Close friend and advisor, whom Johnson had named to take Arthur Goldberg's place in 1965. Expectable in almost every other way, the nomination nonetheless provoked an unexpected reaction arousing more opposition in the Senate than any other court appointment since 1930. So what's this I hear about you pulling in your horns on Fortis? I thought we were going to confirm him. I didn't pull my horns. Well, I said your staff said that you were going to be gone and that you couldn't do much more and that the oh, yeah. Fortis wouldn't be confirmed. I just, and I just got a few days set for uh, September, but I'll be here. I've told Fortis and these folks that you're going to see he's confirmed, and I got, I want you to stand up there and slug it out. Yeah. I don't know what the hell Jim's intentions are. Well, why don't you, why don't you take charge and find out? <laughs> I can't take charge against Jim and Sam Irwin and John McClellan, because they're all, and Strom Thurman. They're hostile, and of course, Fong is hostile, too, as you know. Now, here's what Fortas says simply. Once Johnson had announced that he wasn't running again, he gave senators a reason to oppose me. One senator from South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, was particularly vocal, and 19 Republican senators signed a petition that would deny the president the right to put anybody at all on the court during the remainder of the term. In something that's going to be a foreshadowing of what's going to come later, in 2016, some senators, now it has to be clear, who Johnson had on board was Everett Dirksen, the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate. Do you think these folks want one to go back on that bench? Huh? Do you think they want one to go back? Oh, Christ, I don't want him to go back. Now, you think they do? I don't know. I don't know. That would be the greater evil of God knows. And I'm going to stay. And I'll do my best. Okay, all right. But he didn't have these 19 senators who could block things. They said, we're not going to put anybody on the court during Lyndon Johnson's term. We're going to wait for the election. And if all that isn't bad enough, you know, now there's hearings. If Abe Fortas hadn't been nominated for chief justice, he probably would have sat on the Supreme Court well into the 70s. But now there's hearings. And they find a former law partner 
set up a gig for Fortas to teach summer school at American University. And that's probably not controversial, except his salary isn't paid by American University. It's paid by other clients of this law firm. Some of them had cases potentially heading to the Supreme Court. The payment was 15000 Doesn't sound like too much, but that's 40% of the salary that he earned as a Supreme Court justice. This causes Strom Thurmond to lead the charge, uh, filibustering Fortas's elevation and, and delaying the nomination. Then it's revealed Fortas had accepted a $20,000 fee from the family foundation of stock speculator Lewis Wolfson. He was under investigations for securities fraud, Fortas held the money for almost a year and then returned it three months later after Wolfson was indicted. Time Magazine says although Fortas had not broken any law, he had been clearly guilty of a gross indiscretion. The charges became the major topic of conversation in Washington, from the quarters of the Capitol to Georgetown cocktail parties. Fortas's friends and a fellow Democrats found little to say in his defense. Now this is Time at the Time. The Fortas matter may quite possibly be the most serious in the Supreme Court's 180 years. No Supreme Court justice has ever resigned under pressure. Only one, Samuel Chase, in 1804, has been impeached on such blatantly political grounds that he was acquitted. Okay, it had happened before that Justice William O. Douglas was found to be receiving 12000 a year in fees from a foundation linked to Las Vegas gambling interest, but nothing was happening before the Supreme Court. With Wolfson's case, there's a couple of things. One, he was giving legal advice to Wolfson. And also, Wolfson was appealing his case, and it could reach the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had refused to hear it, and Abe Fortas was, had recused himself from that decision. But Throughout history, royals across the world were notorious for incest. They married their own relatives in order to consolidate power and keep their blood blue. But they were oblivious to the havoc all this inbreeding was having on the health of their offspring. From Egyptian pharaohs marrying their own sisters to the Habsburgs' notoriously oversized lower jaws. I explore the most shocking incestuous relationships and tragically inbred individuals in royal history. And that's just episode one. On the History Tea Time podcast, I profile remarkable queens and LGBTQ plus royals, explore royal family trees, and delve into women's medical history and other fascinating topics. I'm Lindsay Holiday, and I'm spilling the tea on history. Join me every Tuesday for new episodes of the History Tea Time podcast, wherever fine podcasts are enjoyed. Hey, it's Otis Gray. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Well, you should check out this podcast called Sleepy. It's where I read old classics and help you fall asleep. The best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. And that's it. So get tucked in, fluff up the cool side of your pillow, and take a one-way train down to Sleepy Town. Unless you're driving, then please don't listen to Sleepy. New episodes go out every Sunday, so you can get refreshed for your week. Subscribe to Sleepy wherever you get your podcasts. Sweet dreams. Still an all didn't look good. I think the other factor that's always with Fortas and he can't get away from is that he's connected to a president. And so there's a separation of powers issue that continues. So I just wanted to point out the really obvious. Why are we talking about Abe Fortas today? My history can beat up your politics. Look, obviously, there's allegations against uh, Clarence Thomas, Social Justice of the Supreme Court. And he's been receiving income from various sources. Uh, there is a Wolfson-like figure involved, and it just screams of a comparison to Abe Fortas. Here's the contrast, just so it's like we're not always saying history is the same as today. That is not what we are saying. All right. There's similarities. And there's also differences. So what we don't have, as far as I know, is that anyone is doing direct business front of the Supreme Court has like a case pending. And then also the supporter of Clarence Thomas, forgetting his name right now, has not been convicted of a crime so far as I know. There was not an allegation that Fortas was influenced in any way. There is an allegation that it looked bad. And there's something else. 
In recent years, crime in this country has grown nine times as fast as population. At the current rate, the crimes of violence in America will double by 1972. We cannot accept that kind of future for America. We owe it to the decent and law-abiding citizens of America to take the offensive against the criminal forces that threaten their peace and their security. What happens with Fortis is part of, before Nixon even gets to the White House, a potential unpacking of the court. So we talk a lot about packing the court. What Nixon did, at least according to John Dean's description, because he was involved in it, was an unpacking of the court to try to take some of the stuffing out of Earl Warren's court, including the replacement of Earl Warren himself with a more moderate Warren Burger, and make it a more moderate, at least, to conservative Supreme Court. And even before Nixon was president, he was able to do things like, well, he would promise Thurman, Senator Thurman of South Carolina, there would be a South Carolinian considered for the court if Thurman did his part in disrupting the Fortis nomination. Now, Nixon repays that. You know, Thurman gets his favor, although it didn't lead to a justice being on the court. Um, We'll get more into that unpacking a little bit towards the end of the cast. But I want to tell you, it's not just Fortis versus Clarence Thomas, though that is the most obvious um, historical comparison. You'd have to be blind to history, although I'm surprised I'm not hearing a lot about it. Maybe because, again, to be fair, there is a criminal element. Not that Fortis did anything criminal, but Fortis was receiving money from a person who would be indicted. Now he returns the money after the indictment. Fortis, I think, and this happens with a lot of Supreme Court justices, this part, it's not a large salary considering where they live and what they do, and some, like Fortis, um, seek sources of income. They feel they have to support their family like everyone else, uh, and um, and that seems to be Fortis's weakness here. But it's not just a story about Thomas and Fortis. There's such a richness to this story of Justice A. Fortis and his short career on the court, because the other thing to talk about is how close can a president get to a Supreme Court just because this is on everybody's mind, though they're not all saying it as they're opposing that Fortis nomination. They don't oppose it when it's just LBJ putting a guy on the court, liberal replacing a liberal. But when you start to get a chance to replace the chief justice and replace Earl Warren, who had been the bulwark of liberal thinking on the court, that's when the fight starts. And I must say, you're beginning to see the beginnings of what some people call the the great switch. Um, it's not really a switch, as people pointed out. But the, the Southern strategy and that Strom Thurmond is now a Republican and is a senator of from South Carolina and is influencing the Republican Party and leading other Republicans to go along with something that generally the South would like. So you're seeing that switch in this story. You're seeing executive power. You're seeing the Sixth Amendment and individual rights, freedom of speech. Uh, There's a lot of things in the Abe Fortas story. This also in Time magazine. The Justice Department began a grand jury investigation in Cleveland of Fortas's old law firm, Arnold & Porter in connection with the conviction of an official of one of the firm's client companies for conspiracy to obstruct justice. The offense took place after Fortas left the firm, and the department said there was no connection to Fortas. The attorney general's office began looking into Fortas and its outside interest, as did the House Judiciary Committee, as did Chief Justice Earl Warren, who's responsible for the judiciary, in an interesting Parallel to some other of today's events, there is both accusations that, in effect, the Justice Department is going after Fortas to try to convince him to get off the court. And the uh, Senator Robert Griffin, who's spearheading opposition to Fortas, says that he receives death threats in his office. So you have this going on in 1969. But let's revisit a little bit about the um, how the closeness between Lyndon Johnson and Fortas. When he became vice president, Lyndon Johnson is advised by Fortas that there's ways that he can develop rules to prevent companies 
from doing business with the federal government if they discriminate against African Americans. It's Fortas who tells Johnson he needs something like a Warren Commission after the assassination of JFK. They were, uh, got a lot of problems, obviously, as a consequence of this. They will have to take up and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, When Johnson's aide, Walter Jenkins, gets into trouble for soliciting a undercover officer in a D.C. men's room right before the election, who does he turn to? Fortis. Oh, just tell me, is it, can this be true? He uses Fortis to deal with the government of the Dominican Republic. And at the same time, Fortis is acting in many ways as Lyndon Johnson's personal lawyer, drawing up the trust arrangement that regulates Lyndon Johnson's family money. And so when later in 2005, George W. Bush appoints Harriet Meyer to the Supreme Court, this Fortis example is brought. You do hear that in some of the news accounts in the discussion, because you also have an issue of this personal connection of a justice to president, and do we want it? The only mechanism that the Constitution provides to disqualify a person um, is the Senate. So the Senate decided initially that there's no problem with Fortis being a justice, but when it comes to the chief justice appointment, that may be a little too close to comfort, or as Fortas himself indicates, it's actually the opposite. It's not because he's too close to Johnson, it's because Johnson has lost his power. And now being close to Johnson means something else. It means attaching your cart to the wrong horse politically. In the end, it is, according to Fortas, the rumors that Attorney General John Mitchell was sitting on evidence far more damaging to his reputation that convinces him to, he's already abandoned the Chief Justice um, appointment, and now he's going to step down from the Supreme Court. Napoleon Bonaparte rose from obscurity to become the most powerful and significant figure in modern history. Over 200 years after his death, people are still debating his legacy. He was a man of contradictions, a tyrant and a reformer, a liberator and an oppressor, a revolutionary and a reactionary. His biography reads like a novel, and his influence is almost beyond measure. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast, and every month I delve into the turbulent life and times of one of the greatest characters in history, and explore the world that shaped him in all its glory and tragedy. It's a story of great battles and campaigns, political intrigue, and massive social and economic change. But it's also a story about people, populated with remarkable characters. I hope you'll join me as I examine this fascinating era of history. Find The Age of Napoleon wherever you get your podcasts. I want to take a moment to tell you guys about my podcast called The Team House. My name's Jack Murphy. I'm a former Ranger and Green Beret. And I've worked as a national security journalist for the last 10 years. The Team House is a natural extension of that, where I interview former spies and special operations personnel from all over the world. These are exclusive interviews from people who work in the shadows and come a little bit into the light for these exclusive interviews that we do every week, live streamed on YouTube at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And they're available as video on demand and audio on demand wherever you listen to podcasts. As it turned out, in the late, tired hours of last night, or the early, tired hours of this morning, Richard Nixon won the election this time, where eight years ago he lost it in Illinois. It was so close, it took forever, but he won it, and in winning that, he won the presidency. It was, again, one of the closest elections in American history, closer even than when Nixon lost to Kennedy eight years ago. His lead over Humphrey in the popular vote is still only about 25,000 votes, or about one-fifth of a vote per precinct. There are states where we still don't know, even now, for certain, who won. But whichever way these states go now, they can't change the outcome. Here, for the figures up to this minute, are some of the big, important states that kept Nixon, Humphrey, and the country waiting all night to see what happened, beginning with New York. 
There is the result. Humphrey won it. In Michigan, Humphrey won it. In Ohio, Nixon. California, Nixon won it, but barely. Still not sure in Texas. Fortis was threatened with, hinted at, that the Justice Department was looking into his case and might try to prosecute, even though, just like the debate over can we indict a president, there's some feeling you can't do that with the Supreme Court justice, you have to do impeachment. And that the very real possibility existed between these recalcitrant Republican senator, senators at the time and some Democrats, particularly Southern Democrats, that you might have the votes for an impeachment if some real things that looked bad were there. But it was that idea that he might be prosecuted by the Justice Department, which later revealed after Watergate that really Mitchell and others had nothing. This is what John Dean confirms, and we're to get into that. Reporters later looking at the Justice Department realizes there was no smoking gun. There was nothing else that was there. Uh, this is what John Dean says. William Rehnquist, who would later become a Supreme Court justice and actually the chief of the Supreme Court, uh, the chief justice of the United States, the correct title, is heavily involved in the Fortis matter. He's in the Justice Department at this time. Rehnquist's involvement in the Fortis matter was and is a serious problem. He had to know. His legal advice to the Department of Justice saying they had authority to investigate Fortis was thin, if non-existent. Rehnquist knew what Attorney General Mitchell wanted and gave him a dubious legal opinion that gave him political cover. The one ancient precedent Rehnquist relied on for purported authority for the criminal investigation of Fortis was based on investigating an Article I judge, a judge created by Congress for the Northwest Territory, not Article III judge or justice created by the Constitution, meaning the Supreme Court. There was no precedent, seriously, for any such investigation by the Justice Department of sitting justice. The Constitution says that impeachment is the only way to address misconduct. And that clearly be, and this is John Dean talking, that clearly appears to be what is on the Founding Fathers' mind if one reads the Federalist Papers and the debates of the Convention. There's a concern at the time that this Fortis matter also is ruining the reputation of the Supreme Court. All of these things have an adverse effect of the prestige of the court. The personal lives of the justices reflect on the court itself. The court has neither the purse nor the sword and depends in the final analysis on public confidence. So says Jerry Brown. Why is Time Magazine quoting Jerry Brown at the time? Well, he's a Los Angeles lawyer with some cases that might be heading upward. Fortis's departure from the court led to a long-term change in the philosophy of the court. It is much more long-term than Nixon ever intended. Uh, he did, according to John Dean, begin this unpacking project. And John Dean, Rehnquist, and others were specifically charged with finding justices who were, as they said, strict constructionists. Even that term might have been invented by Rehnquist as basically someone who's going to Rule against defendants in civil rights cases and a few other things. Rule against criminals, defendants. It had specific legal outcomes that they wanted from that constructionist viewpoint, and they were looking for justices that way. It doesn't quite work out. Warren Berger is handpicked by Nixon to replace um, Earl Warren, and he's certainly more conservative than Earl Warren, but it doesn't quite work out the way Nixon wants. He's more of a moderate and really depends on the issue. Um, Blackman, Harry Blackman, a friend of Berger, is appointed to the court, and Nixon thought he was kind of getting two solid votes there, tries to appoint a Southerner to the court, is not able to, ends up having to settle. John Dean contributes to this rightward movement of the court and then later writes a book sort of apologizing, explaining his role in it. The search for justice took a twist when John Dean, looking to complete the assignment, make his boss happy, realized this is all before Watergate. 
Rehnquist himself, sitting there in the Justice Department, he could be a candidate. But he'd later regret it. He was responsible for this choice, sort of suggesting it to Nixon. At his confirmation hearings, Rehnquist is criticized for a memo he wrote as a clerk to Justice Robert Jackson during the court's consideration of Brown v. Board of Education. The memo is entitled, A Random Thought on Segregation Cases. He writes, I realize that it's an unpopular and unhumanitarian position for which I have been criticized by liberal colleagues, but I think Plessy v. Ferguson was right and should be affirmed. For obvious reasons, this is this is really looking bad in the ni- early 1970s. As Rehnquist is up for approval. Now, um, Rehnquist claims that the memo didn't embody his own views. Instead, Rehnquist claimed to have prepared the memo at Robert Jackson's request as a rough draft of a statement of his views, of Robert Jackson's views. Dean cannot come to any other conclusion later, looking at it later on, that Rehnquist lied. Jackson's views that he delivered to other Supreme Court members documented at the time don't reflect this Rehnquist memo. It's nothing but Rehnquist's own opinion trying to influence Jackson in the case. And that lie negated the ability of justices to consider Rehnquist and his real opinions. Um, Another interesting story to come out of Dean's book, The Rehnquist Choice, which was written in 2005 and didn't really get... um, didn't get a lot of press, and not, not enough press for the kind of stunning developments in that book, I always felt. But Dean says that the person that Rehnquist really replaced in Nixon's selection process was a woman. Nixon wanted to appoint a woman on the court. And he had a Justice Mildred Lilly, who was on the court in California. And Dean thinks that Lilly would have made a great Supreme Court justice. Nixon was prepared to select her. She won, he wanted the political first of placing a woman on the Supreme Court. She was conservative on law enforcement issues. She was conservative on abortion. Um, and it's the American Bar Association that blocks her selection. They said she was the most uh, qualified female judge in the country to sit on the high court, but they found the ABA that no woman would be qualified. I mean, it was, as Dean says, pure male chauvinism. The American Bar Association at that time was made up by all men, and the old boys did not think it was time for a woman to be on the high court. The other one who objects is Chief Justice Warren Burger, who threatens that he would resign if Nixon put a woman on the court. John Mitchell, John Mitchell tells Nixon this. And according to Dean, Nixon said, well, let him resign. But the ABA shoots down doesn't make the recommendation. And at this time, the early 70s, that ABA recommendation still carries weight. It would have been a real fight for Nixon to go against the American Bar Association's recommendation, which oddly enough is chauvinist. Now presidents disregard it, particularly Republican presidents. Um, Person that heads up the committee of the ABA, incidentally, is Lawrence Walsh, who will later be Iran-Contra prosecutor. What a story, right, involving a lot of people. Um... But for Nixon, this is a win-win. He gets to show that he tried to appoint a woman in court without actually having to take the risk of doing it and is able to put us, in his view, solid conservative and who would end up being, of all Nixon's appointees, the most reliable conservative vote on the Supreme Court and later become Chief Justice William Rehnquist. This is the story of Fortis and a few other things. I just want to tell it all because you start pulling at threads and you see how so many things are related. You have in here, in this story, both the idea of someone maybe being prosecuted unfairly. You have the story of a Supreme Court justice who resigned because just of the look of what was going on and a, a clear attempt to change the nature of the Supreme Court by a president. We ask them to be a part of a society 
under the rule of law, don't we? And how can we ask them that? How can we ask them that? Unless the law is fair and decent and just. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please tell someone else about the program. You know that the podcast is seen out there. So I appreciate anyone mentioning this podcast. It really helps. Thanks so much.